In our previous video lecture, we talked about equivalence relations. So for this video lecture, we are going to discuss equivalence classes. Suppose that we have an equivalence relation on a set A. For an element in your set A, we define the equivalence class of A. We denote it by using this notation. What is this set? This is the set of elements in A such that A is related to X. And we say that the element A is our representative of this class. The equivalence class containing A, this one is the set that contains all elements in capital A that are equivalent to A. And notice also that since... Since our equivalence relation is reflexive, we are sure that the element A is an element of the equivalence class. So by reflexivity, A is equivalent to itself. We now have that A is an element of this equivalence class. So therefore, we know that um, this equivalence class is always not empty because we are sure that it will definitely contain A. Let us have this example. Suppose that A is the set containing the elements 1, 2, 3, 4, and we define this relation as follows. Here are all the elements of the relation R. So let us now find the equivalence classes. So how do we find the equivalence class? So we just look at the elements of A, 1, 2, 3, 4. So let's start with the equivalence class of 1. So by definition, this is the set of all elements that are related to 1. So if we look at our ordered pairs here, these are the ordered pairs containing 1 as the first coordinate, right? So therefore, what are the elements in A that are related to 1? So we have 1, 2, and 3. Next, let us consider the equivalence class of 2. So where are the ordered pairs which contain 2 as its first coordinate? So here. So what are the second coordinates? So we have 1, 2, and 3. This set is just this set. The set containing 1. So this is the equivalence class containing 2. And similarly, if we look at the equivalence class of 3, so that is... That's it. It will also be the set containing 1, 2, 3. Now, let's look at the equivalence class of 4. The only ordered pair here having 4 as the first coordinate is the ordered pair 4, 4. So, therefore, only the element 4 is equivalent to itself. Next, another example. We will just do what we did in the previous example. It's an exercise for you to show that R is an equivalence relation. Okay, let us look at the equivalence class containing 1. So just like what we did earlier, here are the elements of R containing 1 in its first coordinate. So the elements are 1 and 3. What about the equivalence class containing 2? So this one, so we have 2 and 4. What about the equivalence class of 3? So what are the elements which are equivalent to 3? We have 1 and 3, and that is precisely this set. So this is also the equivalence class of 3. What about the equivalence class containing 4? It will be this one. So the elements that are related or equivalent to 4 are 2 and 4. And this is exactly this set. And similarly, we can now check that the equivalence class containing 5 would be the elements, would be the set containing the elements 5, 6. And this will also be the equivalence class containing 6. Next, suppose that our set A is a set of integers and the relation is given by this one, A will be equivalent to B 
if A and B have the same parity. Now, in our previous video lecture, we have already shown that this is an equivalence relation. So, therefore, let us find its equivalence classes. So, let's start, let's say, with 0. What will be the equivalence class containing 0? It will be the set of all A and Z such that A will be equivalent to 0. But this would mean that A and 0 have the same parity. So which means that A and 0 are both even. So therefore, this is the set of all even integers. What about the equivalence class containing 1? So by definition, these are all the elements such that A is equivalent to 1. So this is the set of all A such that A and 1 have the same parity, which means that A is odd, right? So this is the set of all odd numbers. What about the equivalence class of 2? It will be the same as the equivalence class of 0 because 2 is even, correct? And this will be the same as 2, the equivalence class of 2, 4, and so on. And this will be the same as the equivalence class of 1, 3, and so on. Okay, so therefore, in this example, we have only two distinct equivalence classes. Next, let us define this relation. A will be equivalent to B whenever they have the same absolute value. Again, it is an exercise to verify that this is an equivalence relation. Let us now find its equivalence classes. So, just for you to have an idea, let's just check 0. What will be this one? This is the set of all A in R such that A is equivalent to 0, but this would mean that the absolute value of A is equal to the absolute value of 0, which is equal to 0. So therefore, this is just a set containing 0. What about 1? So, again, by definition, we are getting all the elements that are equivalent to 1. And this is, this means absolute value of A is the same as the absolute value of 1. So, we only have this, the elements 1 and negative 1. So, in general... What is now the equivalence class containing R? What do you think? This is just the set containing two elements only, R and negative R, because these are only the two elements which have the same absolute value. Next, let's look at the properties of equivalence classes. So suppose that we have an equivalence relation on a set A. If we take two arbitrary elements... In our set, the following would be equivalent. X is equivalent to Y if and only if their equivalence classes will not be disjoint. They have a common element. And the third one is saying that these two equivalence classes must actually be equal. This theorem is saying that if it happens that they have something in common, then they must be equal. Their intersection is actually the entire thing. In order to prove this equivalence, what I will do is I will first show that property 1 is equivalent to property 3 and then property 1 is equivalent to property 2. So for our proof, let me start with our premise here. Let me just copy, let wiggle be an equivalence relation. And then since we have for any x, y, and a, what do we write in our proof? We have let x, y 
the elements of A. Now, I will proceed with 1 implies 3. So, 1 implies 3. So, that means our assumption is that X is related to Y. We want to show, we want to show that the equivalence class of X is the same as the equivalence class of Y. Since we are showing that two sets are equal, we need to show two things, right? They are subsets of each other. So for the first one, we want to show that the equivalence class of X is a subset of the equivalence class of Y. So how do we show that a set is a subset of another? We get an arbitrary element of the first set and show that it is an element of the second set. So we'll have let Z be an element of the equivalence class of X. What do we want to end up with? We want to end up with Z is an element of Y. So we will do some sort of backward method here. So what we want to do is from here, we want to go to this part. Now, what does it mean for Z to be in the equivalence class of Y? It means that Z must be equivalent to Y. Now, going back to this one, what is the meaning of Z being an element of the equivalence class of X? It means that Z must be equivalent to X. Now, can you now think of how we can put these two things together? We want to end up with this one. I only have Z is equivalent to X, but I want to show that Z is equivalent to Y. What is it that we haven't used yet? Look at this one. X is equivalent to Y and Z is equivalent to X. So what happens there? We now make use of transitivity. By transitivity, Z would now be equivalent to Y because here Z is equivalent to X and X is equivalent to Y. Let me now write the formal proof here. So we have already started with this one earlier. So I now say that since X is related to Y and this relation is transitive, we have Z must be equivalent to Y. And therefore, Z must be an element of the equivalence class of Y. Let us go back to the definition of equivalence classes. The definition is saying that X is an element of an equivalence class if and only if X is equivalent to that element inside there. This is what we have actually been using in our proof. Now for this part, this is left as an exercise. So far, we have already shown 1 implies 3. Now, let's prove 3 implies 1. What is 3? So, we want to show that if the two equivalence classes are equal, then the elements here must be equivalent. Okay, what do we want to do here? We want to show here that X is equivalent to Y. Now, how can we achieve that? How do we go from here to here? So in order to do that, what I will do is make use of the fact that X is an element of X. Correct? We had this note here. The equivalence class of A will always contain A itself. Okay, now why am I using this? Since this is the same, what does that mean? So we have X is an element of Y. What does it mean? It means that X is equivalent to Y. That's it. So thus, X is 
equivalent to y. We are done proving 1 is equivalent to 3. Next, let's prove that 1 is equivalent to 2. Let me start by proving 2 implies 1. We will assume that the intersection is not empty. If the intersection is not empty, then the two equivalence classes are actually the same. Suppose the intersection of equivalence class of x and y is not equal to empty. So, what does it mean for the intersection to be non-empty? Then, we are sure that there exists something in the intersection. So, then, there exists an A element of the intersection. What is it that we want to do, by the way? We want to show that x is equivalent to y. Now, we will make use of this A in order to relate x and y. What does it mean for A to be an element of the equivalence class containing x and the equivalence class containing y? So, this would mean that A is equivalent to x, right? Because of this, and A is also equivalent to y. And A is equivalent to y. What do we want to show? We want to show x is related to y. So can you now see what will we do here in order to get this? We will make use of transitivity and the symmetric property, right? So we will write a equivalent to x as x is related to a, right? So we have x is related to a and a is equivalent to y. I keep on interchanging related and equivalent, all right? So they are just the same. So therefore, we now have that x is equivalent to y. So by the symmetric property and transitivity property of the equivalence relation, then we have x is equivalent to y. So lastly, we want to show that 1 implies 2. Suppose x is related to y, we want to end up with their intersection must be non-empty. How do we show that the intersection of two sets is not, not empty? All we have to do is to find. This is an existential um, proof, right? We just have to find an element that belongs in both this set and this set. What do you think is that? We always make use of the fact that the equivalence class of X contains X, right? So we have X is related to x and our assumption is x is related to y. What does it mean? x is an element of the equivalence class of x and this would mean that x is an element of the equivalence class of y. And that is end. Right? So therefore, X is an element of the intersection. And so, their intersection is not empty. We have achieved our goal. Alright, before we proceed with our discussion, we will, we will need to define partitions. Suppose that we have a set and we have a collection of subsets of A. Let's call that script B. We say that it is a partition of A if it satisfies the following three conditions. First, all the sets in P, in script P, are non-empty. So mathematically, it means for all X in the partition, X is not empty. Next, the second one, covering. What does it say? Every element of A is a member of some element of B. It means that for any element A in capital A, how do we proceed? We want this to be a member of some element of the partition. So meaning to say, 
A is an element of X for some X in B. Okay, so we have two quantifiers here. A universal quantifier and existential quantifier. And since the universal quantifier came first, it means that this partition depends on the choice of small a. Alternatively, this means that when you get the union of all the elements in the partition, we should get a. So, what this is saying is, for example, P is, let's say, A1, A2, A3. Then we have the union of all the AIs. It should be equal to capital A. Next, disjoint pieces. Any two distinct elements of P are disjoint. So meaning to say, if we get this one, we have a universal quantifier again. For any two elements in the partition, either they are equal or their intersection is empty. Now, just to give you a visualization of partitions, what this is saying is that, so suppose this is my set A, and then my, my P is the partition A1, A2, and A3. The reason why I use capital letters is because all the AIs here are subsets of A. Alright? So, what happens is that, that's the reason why we call it partition, is that this is the set A1, this is the set A2, and this is the set A3. Number 1 is saying that all the AIs should be non-empty. Okay? Next, the second one is the covering property. So, all the elements in A, if I get an arbitrary element in A, it will definitely fall in at least either A1, A2, or A3. And as you can see, when I get the union of all these three sets, I get the entire set A. And lastly, we want the disjoint property. The three sets here does not have anything in common. Okay, this is how we view partitions. So the following are partitions of the set A containing 1, 2, 3. So let me first draw A here. So my A contains the elements 1, 2, and 3. Now, partition 1, we only have one element in the partition. And that is actually the set A already. And then for the second one, how did we divide A there? So we divide it as 1, 2, and then 3 here. And then for partition 3, we have, we divided it as 1, 3, and then 2. For partition 4, we had... 2, 3 here, and then 1. And then for the last one, we divided it into subsets of A containing only one element. So we have 1, 2, and 3. Okay, that is the visual representation of all of these partitions. So Partition 1 has only one element. Partition 2, you divided the set A into two sets. Same thing for partitions 3 and 4. And then partition 5, it divides the set into three sets. Now, let's look at some non-examples in order to have a full understanding of the definition. Why is this not a partition of A? So, Remember here that we still have our A as the set containing 1, 2, 3. Why is this not a partition? Because we have an empty set. Non-empty. So we have this one is not satisfied. What about S2? Why is this not a partition? Notice that we don't have all the elements of A. Correct. So in this case, let's look 
at the definition for all A, in the set A, we should always be able to find some set for which that element belongs in that set. So how do we show that we do not satisfy the covering property? We get the negation. So the negation is there exists an A in A such that A does not belong in X for all, for all X in P. So in this example, what is that A? 2. Correct? So, 2 is not an element of any partition. Well, we only have, so this is for all x in S2. Well, S2 here has only one element. And also, you can see that when you get the union of all the sets, of all the sets in the partition, you do not get the set 1, 2, 3, right? What about this one? Why is this not a partition? Because we have something in common. So we have 1, 2, 3. So the first set is this one. And then the second set involves 2 and 3. So this one, not this joint. What about S4? It has an extra element. What is that property that is not satisfied? The covering property right because the union so if this is a1 a2 when you get the union of a1 and a2 that is not the set a because it has an extra element the element four what about s5 why is this not a partition of a because remember that a partition should contain sets and these are not sets right However, if we have written it as 1, the set containing 1, the set containing 2, and the set containing 3, then that will be a partition. So here the reason is because the elements in S5 are not sets. The partition should contain subsets of A. Let's look at a few more examples. So the following are partitions of the set of integers. So in this case, we have partitioned Z into two. So right, if you are an integer, you are either even or you are odd, correct? And you can also partition it into three. So we have the set of all positive integers the set of all negative integers, and this one, the set containing only the zero integer. What about number three? It says that it contains a case where a k is of this form. Just for you to imagine what is going on, let us list down some elements. So for example, I have a zero. A zero contains which elements? So it's starting with, you multiply this one with three, and then you get the succeeding integer. So in this case, it's 0, 1, 2. How about A1? A1 would be 3 times 1. So it's 3 and then the succeeding integers. 3, 4, 5. A2, 2 times 3 is 6. And then the succeeding two integers, 6, 7, 8, and so on. What about A negative 1? A negative 1 would be negative 1 times 3 is negative 3, and then negative 2, negative 1. What about A sub negative 2? Negative 2 times 3 is negative 6, and then plus 1, negative 5, negative 4. So now that we have listed it this way, it will now be easy to see that all of these sets are non-empty, correct? All of them contains three elements. Second, What's the second property? Covering. When you get the union of everything, right, you will really get the entire set of integers. And the last part, disjoint. Pairwise, when you get any two elements in this partition, they will always be disjoint. So that's why this forms 
a partition of z. We can also partition n into four parts. So here, so we have the set containing one only, the set containing two only, the set containing three only, and this last set, it means the rest of the natural number. So we have four, five, six, and so on. So this is a partition of the set of natural numbers. Now here is the reason why we are studying partitions. We will now connect the relationship of equivalence classes and partition. So what do we have here? Suppose that we have an equivalence relation on A, then we can form a partition of a and how do we how do we form this partition we make use of our set of equivalence classes so take note this partition here this one contains all the equivalence classes of a in our first example we were able to determine the equivalence classes of a so A is the set 1, 2, 3, 4, and what are the distinct equivalence classes? We partitioned it into 1, 2, and 3. Take note that this is the equivalence class containing 1 and the equivalence class containing 4. This is a partition of A, right? What about this one? The distinct equivalence classes are this three sets so we have one three that's the first set two four and five six so this is the equivalence class containing one equivalence class containing two and equivalence class containing five similarly here so our set a here is the set of integers and we were able to partition it as the equivalence class containing 0 and the equivalence class containing 1 because the equivalence class containing 0 is the set of all even integers and the equivalence class containing 1 is the set of all odd integers. So just for you to imagine what is going on, let's suppose that we can write it like this, A1, A2, a3. This set does not necessarily have to be finite, but just for you to imagine that this set contains all the equivalence classes of A. Alright, so we will now show that this forms a covering. The first property, non-empty. Let us recall the definition of the non-empty property for partitions we have for all X in P, we want to show that all of them are not empty. I will just write this using the context that we have. In our context, what are the elements of our partition? The elements are equivalence classes. So we will write it as for all A in the partition, this is not empty. Why is this true? Because we are sure that this equivalence class will contain A. Let this one be an arbitrary element of P. So by reflexivity, we know that A is contained in the equivalence class of A. And so this is not empty. Next, we'll check the covering part. What does the covering part say? From the definition first, the definition says that for all small a in capital A, we can find a set in the partition for which a is contained in that set. So this is for sum x in P. Just to give you a diagram there. So let's say this is A. When I get an arbitrary A here, I am sure that this will be contained in some X where X is an element in the partition. Our sets here are equivalence 
classes. So we have for all A in capital A, we want to show that small a is an element of something for some thing in B. And what is that? We are sure that A is an element of the equivalence class containing A. So this one is really true. Lastly, disjoint. So the definition says that if we get two, let, let me just call it x1 and x2. For, if we get two elements in the partition, either they are equal or they are disjoint. Our x1 and x2 will be equivalence classes. So for any a1, a2 in the partition, we want to show that these two are equal or they are disjoint. Okay, so how do we prove this? So let we get two arbitrary equivalence classes. We are showing an or statement. When we are proving an or statement, what do we do? We can assume that the other one is false and show that the other one must be true. So in this case, what will we do? What I will use is suppose that their intersection is not empty. So suppose their intersection is not empty. Why is it true that they must be equal? Let us recall this result. This one is saying that if the two equivalence classes have something in common, then they must be the same. Look at this picture. If they have something in common, then they must actually be equal. And that is what we have over here. We are assuming that they have something in common. So therefore, by that property, by properties of equivalence classes, then they must be equal. Now, let's look at the next theorem. The next theorem says that here we have a partition on a set A. There is an equivalence relation on A such that the equivalence classes are precisely the parts of B. It's a little bit long. So let's see what is the relationship between theorem 1 and theorem 2. The theorem 1 is saying that if you have an equivalence relation, then you have a partition. And that partition will actually be the set of equivalence classes. Whereas, theorem 2 is saying the other way around. You have a partition P. You can find an equivalence relation. And what will happen is that the partition, again, will turn out to be the set of equivalence classes. So can you now see the relationship between theorems 1 and theorem 2? Again, with theorem 1, we are starting with an equivalence relation. If that is true, if we have an equivalence relation, then we have a partition on the set. Theorem 2 is saying that if you have a partition on the set, then you can find an equivalence relation. This is an existential result, right? Because it says there is an equivalence relation, so we have to construct what is that equivalence relation? Let me just copy my premise here. I am starting with a partition. We will now define our equivalence relation as follows. So for any A, B, and A, remember, this one is a relation on A, so we will relate two arbitrary elements of A. What do you think is the most natural way to define this? So we have A will be related to B if and only if A and B belong to the same set in the partition. This is for some X in B. We will now prove that this is really an equivalence relation. So let's first prove reflexivity. 
we want to show that for any A in A, A is related to itself. What does it mean for A to be related to itself? We want to show, let's look at the definition again, this one. For you to be related, you have to be inside a set in the partition. So just to give you an idea what is happening here, let's draw a visualization. So let's say that this is x1, x2, x3. So all the elements here in x1, I will now say that I, I have defined this relation as all of these elements here will now be equivalent. They will be related. I will not make use of the word equivalent because we haven't shown that they, it is really an equivalence relation. Okay. All the elements x3 in x3 will be related. Okay. So first, how do we show that if I get an arbitrary element here, it will be related to itself? Can you give me a set? To which this part, so let's say this is my A. Why am I sure that there will always be a set in the partition? That is true because of which property of partitions? Covering. The covering part. So since, so wait, let me start first with let. I have a quantifier here. So let A be an element of A. So since... P is a covering, then we know that there exists an X in the set such that A would be an element of X. So we're sure here that we can always find a set in the partition to which A belongs. Next, let's show that it is symmetric. So we want to show that for all a, B, and A, if A is related to B, then B is related to A. So we start with let A, B, and A, and A is related to B. So we have A is related to B, but when are they related? Our definition says that they will only be related whenever they belong in the same set in the partition. So let's call this set X. All right. That's the name of the, of the set. So thus, A, B is an element of capital X for some X in P. Why is it now true that B is related to A? Yes, of course, because if A and B are in X, then B and A will also be in X. Lastly, for the transitivity. So for transitivity, we want to show that if we get three arbitrary elements in the set and A equivalent to B, and B is equivalent to C, then A is equivalent to C. Alright, so we have let A, B, C be in A, and suppose A is equivalent to B, and B is equivalent to C. Let's draw what is happening there. So we have A is equivalent to B. It means that they belong in the same set right? X. But B is equivalent to C. We only know that B and C belongs in the same set, right? So B and C probably belongs in the same set. Why? Now, just by looking at this one, something is already happening. Look at this. From the diagram, you can see how our, how our, how our proof will flow. A and B is contained in X. B and C is contained in Y. What can you see there? B belongs in both capital X and capital Y. So X and Y, the two sets X and Y, have something in common. 
what is the property of partitions? It's either you are equal or you are disjoint. But we have shown that two sets X and Y are not disjoint. So therefore, they must be equal. So therefore, this X and Y are the same. And so, A, B, and C will now belong to the same set. Let me just write that down. We have A, B element of X for some X in P and B, C is an element of Y for some Y in P. Note that B is an element now of X intersection Y. By the disjoint property, we now have that x must be equal to y. Therefore, we are only interested with a and c. They are now both elements of x. Correct? Because, look at that, a is an element of x, c is an element of y, but x and y are just the same. And so, that is precisely the definition of our relation, right? If they belong in the same set, then A must be related to C. So we have shown that this one is an equivalence relation. So just to apply what we have learned, again, Theorem 2 says that if we have a partition, we can define our equivalence relation. And what is our equivalence relation? They will be related if and only if they belong in the same set. So therefore, in this case, we are partitioning the set of integers to the set of even and odd integers. So therefore, when will what will be the equivalence relation here? They will be equivalent if and only if they belong in the same set. So it's either they are both even or they are both odd, right? So it means there, they will be equivalent if they belong in the same set. So we now have here that X and Y have the same parity. For the next one, this we have already seen this earlier, the set of even integers, the set of all positive integers or the set of natural numbers and the set containing zero. What will be the relation here they will be related let's look at it again they will be related if and only if they belong in the same set so this means they are both negative or they are both positive or they are both equal to zero so x and y have the same sign or they are both zero and lastly we have here x is related to y if and only if what are the partitions here? The sets in the partition, they are elements of a k for some k.